Welcome to Get to the Root of It. I am Laurel Brennan, and I am very excited to be here with Professor Tom. He told me I can talk, call him Tom, so we'll call him Tom today. Welcome. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here, Laurel. So Thomas Seeger teaches engineering business practices at Arizona State University and is the co-founder of the Morozco Forge Ice Bath Company. Dr. Seegers earned his PhD in environmental engineering at Clarkson University in Potsdam, New York. He has published over 180 research articles, been cited in scientific journals over 8,000 times, and has won over 5 million in research funding from the National Science Foundation, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and the U.S. Department of Defense. His expertise in resilient infrastructure systems and environmental sustainability has made him a popular speaker and a consultant to the Army Corps of Engineers and the Office of Naval Research. Nonetheless, Dr. Seeger's teachings in leadership, entrepreneurship, organizational communication, and human resilience have prompted him to reorganize his career around a novel concept called self-actual engineering, in which he applies engineering principles to a fuller realization of human potential. Informed by his own transformational health journey, Dr. Seeger's most recent research reveals the relationship between deliberate cold exposure and human well-being. It's an awesome bio, and I found him on Instagram about cold exposure, and I said, hey, can you come talk to us about cold exposure? And then I learned all these amazing things about his background. So we're very honored to have you. Honored guest Thanks for today. inviting me. Yeah. You so, have something must have piqued your curiosity when you were on Instagram. What did you see that made you go, I want to learn more? Well, I've had a personal, um, I've only gotten an ice bath once and it, I'll share the details about it later, but I want to learn more about it so that I can understand how to avoid problems and maximize benefit. So you were, um, just talking about ice baths as if you you knew more than me. So I wanted to, to follow you to learn more. So what in your personal and professional background got you into cold exposure as a, you know, a biohack? I read a book uh, by Mike Cernovich. Before Mike Cernovich became like a big time political journalist, um, he wrote a book called Guerrilla Mindset. And I was at a point in my life, I just separated from my wife, I'd stalled out in my career, and I was reading everything about self-improvement and trying to learn how the world works in this kind of a midlife crisis way. One of the things that Cernovich said you got to do is cold showers. So, you know, I'm trying advice and... Um, it's Phoenix and it's the winter time and I turn the shower all the way down to cold and I hated every minute of it. And it's yeah. not even that cold, but it made me angry. So I'm in the shower and I'm like, the hell with you, Cernovich, you know, but I <laughs> read a book and I'm a professor and I got to experiment with things. And I did that for maybe a month or two. And then the tap water got too warm. Well, my former student and co-founder at Morosco Forge, Jason, he was connected with some people like a Burning Man group and they're doing yoga and they're doing breath work and they'd heard about Wim Hof and they're like, oh, we're going to do ice baths. So we bought a bunch of ice cubes and put them in the trough. Whole body is so much better than the cold shower. When I was in the cold shower, it made me angry. My heart rate, my blood pressure went up. But when I got in the ice bath, like up to the neck, breathe through it relax, get into a meditative state. And I knew that this is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. The problem with ice baths in Phoenix is that, you know, it's 115 degrees out and you get your 200 pounds of ice from the quickie mart or whatever, and you pour it all in there. And 15 <laughs> minutes later, it's melted. So Jason and I thought, uh, well, we're engineers. We ought to be able to figure this out. And it took us over $20,000 worth of parts and tinkering and invention to come up with the first Morozco Forge that actually made ice. And that was what we wanted. We wanted the ice cubes in the ice bath because that's what we'd grown accustomed to. There are 
bunch of other, you know, cold plunge companies, or sometimes they call them ice bath companies. But I'm the kind of guy who wants ice in my ice bath. So now uh, you can see it right over my left shoulder. Um, you know, this is, it's not the latest model, but it's the one that I have. I live in a high rise apartment building. I have a small balcony. And so this one is made specifically to fit on my balcony. I plunge at 34 degrees every morning. I've got it so the sun comes in in the morning. So I get a little dawn in my eyes and I get some uh, exercise with my steel mace afterwards. I've discovered since Jason and I started a whole myriad of metabolic and mental health benefits that come with cold exposure. We we got started because it was kind of fun and it was cool and it was social and it felt good. L let me rephrase. It feels terrible, like when you <laughs> first get in. But after the first 15 or 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds, the, the norepinephrine and the dopamine start hitting your brain. And even if your toes are miserable and in pain and your fingertips are like hurting, you can't help but smile because all of those neurotransmitters are now like swimming around in you know, your system, making you happy. It's impossible to be in a bad mood after you, you know, get out of an ice bath because you have two or three times the dopamine in your bloodstream as you did when you start. And we know dopamine is, is hitting all that reward circuitry. So for me, um, the motivation to do the ice bath started off with that feeling. You get in there and you know something is happening. But it had to kick in my scientific curiosity when I started watching people's bodies and attitudes transform. So I started publishing articles or reading about it in the library. Um, and we just put a few things up. They were dramatic transformations. Jason's wife, Adrian, she resolved her Hashimoto's thyroid iris by starting ice baths and changing her diet. That's amazing. They told her she was going to be on prescription medications for the rest of her life. And now zero. We had another guy very early on, Dean Hall in Oregon. He wanted to do ice baths because he was a leukemia patient. There was no cure. There was no treatment. His doctor said, this is what's going to kill you. Dean, um, he felt pretty down about it. He lost his wife to brain cancer. He was a cancer survivor himself. But something kicked in for him. And he said, well, doc, I want to do something with the little time I have left. I want to inspire other cancer survivors. Doc says, what, what do you want to do? He goes, I want to go to Ireland and I want to swim the entire length of the Shannon River. You know, swimming is my thing. It's my sport. And I want to do something that shows other cancer survivors that every moment is still worth living. Doc says, Dean, you could get in the city pool and it could kill you. And Dean says, well, I guess I don't really have anything to lose then. He gets in the pool. He starts doing his laps. He gets a little stronger and he gets a little stronger to train for the Shannon River in Ireland. Dean decided to swim the entire length of the Willamette River in Oregon, where he lives. He wrote a book about it. It just came out. He went into the river with cancer. He came out of the river without cancer. He went back to his doctor. He had a whole medical supervision team. And his doctor said, if I hadn't done these blood tests myself, I'd say you were misdiagnosed, but you can see the pictures of his lymph nodes. He's not oh. misdiagnosed. So here are these two like really dramatic stories. And I said, well, I have to understand this. So I'm going into the library and I'm going to figure out scientifically what is going on inside the body. Well, it turns out that all as a first approximation, all of the chronic illnesses have their origins in insulin resistance or in a metabolic disorder that relates to a degradation of your mitochondria. So we're talking Alzheimer's, heart disease, uh, type 2 diabetes, obesity. All of it relates to metabolic disorders. So there were these two. There was uh, Adrian, there was Dean Hall. And the more I learned about metabolism, the more I learned about uh, the role of cold exposure, the more I knew I had to learn. In particular, because my son was six years old when he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. There's two types. Type 1, it used to be called juvenile diabetes. 
It's when the islet cells in the pancreas are attacked by your own immune system. They no longer make insulin. And so my son, since the age of six, has required insulin injections. That was 22 years ago. And that started my curiosity about health and metabolism. I had no idea when I started ice baths that it was going to intersect with diabetes in this way. Well, there's also type 2 diabetes. And type 2 diabetes is different because in type 2 diabetes, you make plenty of insulin, but the cells resist the action of insulin to slow the transportation of glucose. They, they leave it in the bloodstream. By slowing the transportation of glucose from the bloodstream into the cell, it means that the mitochondria don't get overworked. Type 2 diabetes is a mitochondrial disorder, and it's curable, it's reversible, it's resolvable, whatever the verb is that the medical doctors would use. I'm an engineer, so I'm a problem solver, not a, a prescription writer, and I don't give medical advice. I tell stories and I read journal articles. But type 2 diabetes is optional. So uh, I mentioned I was divorced at this point, separated, I'm back out on the dating scene, and I was dating a woman very thin. I didn't know that she suffered from anorexia. I thought she was just thin, but she was living, not, uh, not in me, like we would go out to dinner and we'd have a great time. I was eating keto, she was eating keto. When she wasn't with me, she was pretty much living on soda pop and aspirin. Too many carbs, not enough protein and fat. Her HbA1c, which is a measure of um, peak blood sugar levels, it climbed all the way up into the high sevens. She was at 12% body fat. At the time, her HbA1c indicated she was type 2 diabetic. It made no sense. Usually people associate that with obesity. But if you live under calorie restriction and all you're eating are carbs, you can be type 2 diabetic as well as thin. Type 2 diabetes is not a symptom, not a, not a, of obesity. <laughs> Type 2 diabetes exists not as a result of obesity, but as a coincidence. The underlying condition is the mitochondrial disorder. So uh, I got her in the ice bath. I got her off the soda. She brought her HbA1c from 7.8 down to 5.2. Essentially, her type 2 diabetes is resolved. And this accumulation of, if they didn't have scientific explanations, we would just consider them medical miracles, meant I had to learn more about deliberate cold exposure than I could get off the Joe Rogan podcast. You know, I had to keep going in the library, keep interviewing people, um, and keep trying to integrate the science and experience of what is going on with the people in the ice bath. Yeah. So you had multiple stories. I love your stories. I, I like to learn through stories. I think that's the best way to share information. It sticks in your, in your brain. Um, so thank you for sharing each of those. Um, in, in your bio, you mentioned self-actual engineering. Tell us about that. I'm a civil engineer mm -hmm. and, um, you know, that means I work on infrastructure, uh, water systems and roads and bridges and highways and dams and things like this. But when I got into disaster resilience and how do we respond in a crisis, I learned that it wasn't the concrete or the steel. It is the human ingenuity. So it is the human response to the crisis that makes a catastrophe or a, a near miss, you know, um, d d a, an outcome that avoids the catastrophe and we learn a lot. So where does that human ingenuity come from? So I'm learning a lot about human nature and psychology, and it brought me to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's uh, misunderstood, partly because when he published it, it was 1943. You know, the country had just finished the Depression. It was now World War II. And Maslow postulated incorrectly, but at the time, he said these needs, they have to be met in a certain order. At the bottom of his pyramid was safety, security, shelter, food, sex, pleasure. A little bit higher up, he put uh, sort of interpersonal relationships, uh, status, 
uh, self-esteem. A little higher up, mastery. When you go high enough for Maslow, self-actualization, this idea of being everything that you can be. Well, at the time Maslow published his Hierarchy of Needs, Viktor Frankl, he's another Austrian psychologist, was in a series of Nazi death camps. He is trained as a psychologist and he's thinking about his experiences there of near total deprivation and what motivates people to persist. When he's liberated, Frankl publishes his own account of human motivation and it really mixed up Maslow. Instead of you have to have safety and then you have to have, you know, friendships and community and a sense of belonging. Instead of satisfying these things in order, Frankel figured out that man can suffer almost any deprivation if he has a reason why. What come, came first for Frankel in the death camps was meaning and then all the other human motivations. So this scrambles up the hierarchy. They don't come in any particular order. Um, they all sort of interact with one another. So when you think about uh, Maslow, Freud, Adler, and Frankel, you get a pretty good tapestry of all these different human motivations. So where do I work in civil engineering? I work right at the bottom. Shelter, food, you know, electricity, stuff like that. This is where civil engineers have always worked. And I thought, well, what if we tried to apply the principles of engineering at other places in the pyramid? What if we used engineering methods, design, based upon an understanding of mathematics and science to improve things elsewhere in the pyramid? And so that's consistent with me, you know, reading about all this self-help literature, reading Cernovich's book, trying, how would I redesign my life as an engineer so that I can achieve better relationships, greater self-efficacy, a better sense of self-esteem and construct meaning in my life. So one of the things that has uh, given me meaning is talking about the need for cold exposure that we all as human beings have. You were um, you're sort of impressed. There's these series of transformations, these revelations through personal experiences that I'm having. Uh, cold exposure helped me recover from Hashimoto's. Cold exposure helped me fight cancer. Cold, cold exposure uh, helped resolve my diabetes. Well, we have two customers at Moraz Coforge with multiple sclerosis. I had to learn more about that. There are 17 FDA approved drugs to help manage the symptoms of multiple sclerosis. None of them work as well as deliberate cold exposure. There is clearly something fundamental going on. And it goes all the way back to our evolutionary biology. Human beings didn't used to be, you know, so numerous. We didn't used to have 7 billion people on the planet. In between the ice ages, the human beings were pushed to the margins of the hab habitable areas of Africa. Well, some people ask me, Tom, if you're from like the equatorial regions, you know, if your people are Central America or Africa, why do you need cold exposure? And the answer is that there are four glaciers in East Africa where human, where homo sapiens are thought to have evolved. Those glaciers, I mean, it's Wim Hof takes his people up Mount Kilimanjaro, which is in East Africa. Being at the equator didn't protect the earliest homo sapiens from cold exposure because all of the glacial melt streams that, that, um, that the human beings uh, in during the ice ages had to survive, they were all cold. And it turns out that humans are aquatic. Why do we have downward facing nostrils instead of outward facing like primates do? Why do we have subcutaneous fat like dolphins and whales instead of the visceral fat that apes have? Why are apes covered with hair, but we're practically naked from the head down, more like a manatee and less like a chimpanzee? It's because we are aquatic. This is why we walk upright. If you've ever seen a picture, you know, of a, an orangutan wading through the water, you're going to understand why we walk upright so that we can forage and swim and dive in the water. 
And what else do we do in the water? Give birth. It was our earliest ancestors' existence in the cold streams of East Africa that shaped our evolutionary biology. We are built to expect exercise. Everyone accepts that. If your body doesn't get enough exercise, you, you sort of devolve into a state of dis-ease. And everybody's got that figured out. Our bodies were built to expect sunshine. And not everybody believes that. Some people will cover themselves up and they'll forget that their ancient ancestors were in the sun all the time and that, that our bodies need sunshine to make vitamin D, for example. Our bodies were also built by evolution to expect cold exposure. And if you don't get enough exercise, you get sick. If you don't get enough sunshine, you get sick. If you don't get enough cold, you get sick because our bodies need these things. So now, yeah, you know, one of the things that gives me meaning in my life is talking about cold exposure, telling the stories, the rationale for it, and um, explaining the mechanisms by which these people have experienced their incredible health transformations. Yeah, so cool. I love the way your brain works. I love the way you have um, taken from different areas of expertise from psychology and um, anthropology and and joined it with your your engineering. It's so fascinating. I love it. And I've never looked at cold exposure as um, an area that's required for us. This is fairly new-ish to me, maybe yep. the last year. I don't know if you um, did any research on my background, but I also have MS. And um, I did not know that. Yeah. So wow. this is especially interesting to me. I'm, I'm now focused on brain health, dementia prevention. Um, so this is especially interesting. And I, I, I'd like to share my personal story because maybe you can help me problem solve kind of what went wrong. So mm -hmm. I had planned a, a retreat, a brain health retreat last October. And I knew that one of the things we were going to do on that retreat was learn about Wim Hof and get in an ice bath. So I also knew that I didn't like cold at all. So I prepared and I would start with finishing my shower with, you know, 10 seconds of a cold spray and then 20 seconds of a cold spray and I would gradually build up. So I knew I was going to do this cold plunge and I had sort of prepared for it. I had done cryotherapy once. Um, I liked it. Some people felt energized by it. For me, it relaxed me. So I don't know what that means about my mitochondria, but um, I wanted to like, they bundled me up in a robe and gave me a cup of hot tea and I wanted to go to sleep after my, my cryotherapy experience. But <clears throat> so fast forward to last October, and we're doing this cold plunge. It was, it was 50 degrees outside. We were right next to the Potomac River. So we're all kind of shivering in our bathing suits, waiting to get in. And multiple people went before me. The Hargobind, who's the retreat owner and the, the one kind of guiding us through this cold plunge, was encouraging us to try to get to two minutes if that was okay. Um, no one was forced to get in. Some people didn't go in. It was all totally voluntary. Some, you know, some people went in for 30 seconds and said, I don't feel good. I'm getting out. Um, some people went in and cried. Um, I was like, Whew, what, uh, okay, it's my turn. And Hargobin was encouraging us to, to, to go under. So after people kind of got settled with the water at their chest, he would encourage them, you know, okay, well move a little bit. So now the water that's right around you has warmed up. See if you can move a little and get down to your neck. And so I said, all right, I'm just going to go for it. When I get in, I'm going to dunk. So I did it. I went right down, put my head under. Um, and immediate, I, I understand a little bit more about it now, but how, you know, a child falls into a frozen pond and they can survive for, you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes under there and be fine. Um, I, I had like this gasp reflex, I guess, like, I was like, did I forget to hold my breath? Did I breathe in water? And then everything sort of slowed. And I had given, I, I connected it later to being similar to childbirth. 
So I had, I've had three natural childbirths. There is a time when you just have to give up control. There is, there's no fighting it. it. It is, you go into this meditative space and let things just happen the way they're going to happen. And for me, that's what it was like. It, it hurt like immediately. I was, it was like labor and, but I knew this was only, you know, two minutes. It's like a, a contraction. Right. And he told me two minutes are up. And I, I looked confused, like what? It feels like I've been here for 30 seconds. It's like, yep. no, it's, it's been two minutes. It's time to get out. And then I was in slow motion. Like I could, it took me 45 seconds to go from lying to standing to get out. Um, and then he had us, you know, big body movements. We all screamed at the river and <laughs> warmed our body up. And eventually, you know, 20, 30 minutes later, um, got into the jacuzzi. And it was a kind of a nice, nice a little thermal contrast. Yeah. yeah. But the question I have for you is the the feeling in my fingertips did not come back for a, f a long time, like a full day. I had very, not no feeling, but reduced feeling in my fingertips. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of like your fingers are covered with calluses. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And uh, for about multiple weeks, I had reduced sensation in my, one of my thumbs. Mm -hmm. So Hargobind is worried about me doing it again, as we've returned to retreat this year, I'm like, well, maybe I sit with my hands out or um, maybe I have my hands under my armpits or what was the reason for that? And um, can we talk about safety who, you know, I know there's sometimes a difference between the way women respond, the way men respond. Um, can we go there? The um, sensation that you felt in your fingertips, uh, it's not rare. Uh, um, I can think of at least a half a dozen other people who have just, they're starting their cold practice and they're going all in. They're like, I encourage people to start like this. Uh, keep the fingers under the armpits. It's okay to leave your toes out if you want. But you, you went from zero to 60 right away. Um, there's something called non frostbite cold injury. Frostbite is when you freeze the water in the cells of your skin. Like imagine ice crystals showing up inside the cells of your skin. Uh, it's very injurious. Um, but the non frostbite cold injury, it doesn't form ice inside your body it changes the circulation in the, in the extreme extremities. So yes, in the fingertips, it could be in the toes and your body needs some time to remodel the circulation to those extremes. Now, the, everyone that I know that has kept it up, it has resolved itself over the course of a couple or three weeks. Mm -hmm. And age doesn't seem to be a factor here. This is from people in their 20s all the way up to people in their 60s. And so they sort of protect their fingertips and their toes, and then they continue about their cold exposure. The blood vessels remodel, then the sensation fully returns. Um, but there are things that are happening in your body. That's the wonderful thing about the ice bath. You get in and you're like, you know something is happening. If you're going to do red light therapy, you know, you're standing there and you're like, okay, oh, I'm getting my light is if you do in hyperbaric, you know, you're in there and you're going, I might, I might fall asleep. Is that all right? And they say, you just got to come back eight more times and then it's going to be really good uh, for you. But when you get in the cold, something is happening right away. It's fast and it's powerful. So I've never been concerned, um, at least over the long term with what you've described, that feeling of like a partial numbness. Sometimes it uh, oscillates between tingling and numbness because my guess is that you haven't been cold in a long time, that you haven't done that kind of, like when we're kids, 
and you know we run around outside and our mothers are like put on a jacket yeah. I'm not cold mom you know we no longer experience as adults the cold in the same way that we did when we were kids and we forget Kids know, kids know when they're cold, they know when to come in, you know, but they're having such a great time. My kids used to think the snow was like being at the beach. They put on a hat and they would make castles all day. But kids have a lot of brown fat. Babies are about 30% brown fat. Babies don't have mature muscles, so they can't shiver. So how would a baby stay warm? Oh, non-shivering thermogenesis. You activate the brown fat, it starts burning glucose and lipids to keep the body warm. As the muscles mature, brown fat declines and muscle shivering sort of takes over. But then we get to be, I don't know, grownups, as if we know better. And we say things like, you do, oh, I don't like the cold. Oh, I don't like to be cold. Oh, I'm gonna move somewhere. So, you know, we're now we have our driver's license and we're in our SUVs and we have those heated seats. And we're like, oh, you know, it's winter. It's so uncomfortable. We do everything in, in our power to stay comfortable. And who can blame us? You know, the pilgrims didn't have a choice. They starved to death and it was cold and our ancestors were miserable and wretched. And if they could have had an SUV with a heated seat, they would have hit that <laughs> button and cranked it up too. But evolutionarily, technology changes so much faster than our, in, our feelings do. So we do all the things that make us feel good, and we create these deficits of, of exposure and environment that make us more vulnerable than we're really supposed to be. By the age of 40, over 95% of Americans have zero detectable brown fat. And I kind of want to say, well, that's not right. You know, that's, that's not the way we're designed to be. So when you got in, did you shiver? Did you teeth chatter? So. Um, no. Typically, people do. If not right away, they will start shivering after they get out. Uh, it's called the after drop. The circulation returns to their limbs, um, their core uh, temperature. As the blood comes back from their cold limbs, their core temperature drops, and they will begin to shiver. But once you acclimate to the cold, you've recruited new brown fat, you've um, created the non-shivering thermogenesis pathways through that brown fat, shivering goes way down. Now your body is making a lot of adjustments, nervous system adjustments, vascular adjustments, uh, lipid adjustments, visceral fat, that is your belly fat goes down, your subcutaneous fat goes up. All of it is improved metabolism, improved vascular function. But the adjustment that you're feeling in your fingertips, um, it's not unusual. So I'm much less concerned than your mentor would be. Okay. Yes. He just, he wanted to reach out and find out um, from the people who trained him if he was going to hurt me if I came back and did the same thing. He asked me if I, if I had Renault syndrome. I'm like, not that I know of. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I almost said I'm looking forward to doing it again. <laughs> I maybe I'm looking forward to it. I mean, like I said, it it is it is painful. Um, I I was a a test subject. My my husband was working on a PhD at the University of Stirling in Scotland, and we were poor students, but we had two kids. So um, whenever there was a sign up that said, you know, five pounds to participate in this research study and 10 pounds, I was like, me, me, I would go sign up. And one of them was how long can you keep your arm in this ice bucket? <laughs> yep. It's called the cold presser test. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was my first exposure to cold therapy. Actually. Um, I think I may have gotten up to a minute, but I don't know how I did that. To be honest, I was being paid. Yeah. I felt like I, I should go as long as I could. Um, Kelly McGonigal wrote a book called The Upside of Stress. She's a Stanford psychology professor. She's done a great TED talk, The Upside of Stress. And she talks about how your beliefs about stress are more important to the health outcomes than the experience of stress itself. Mm -hmm. So you tell yourself a story. This is all the Viktor Frankl meaning making. And you might say, oh, this is stressful, but it's making me stronger. And those people live way longer. 
Well, she talked about the cold presser test because it is a standardized, validated psychological instrument to stress subjects. And then you can measure all kinds of health responses, uh, blood pressure, um, electroconductivity on their fingertips, which is an indication of how much they're sweating. Um, the heart rate variability. So all these physiological measures that say, how well does their body handle stress? Now, McGonagall never said that she actually did the cold presser test. She said she, as a psychologist, <laughs> administered it and observed it, but she never said, you know, and I got a minute and a half or something like that. She doesn't really talk about herself a lot in this book. And there's this one line where she says, if you immerse yourself in freezing water, it will kill you in two minutes. Now, I thought that was pretty interesting. I wanted to take her book and get in my ice bath and read those sections over <laughs> and over again, but then I might forget when two minutes go by and, and just die. It feels so terrible when you get in that people think it must be bad for you. It, how could this possibly be good if it makes me so uncomfortable? Well, a lot of things are like that. A lot of things that don't feel real great turn out to be good for you. It's called hormetic stress. Uh, and Nietzsche has that line that we've all translated, you know, that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It takes a long time. Kelly McGonigal's, you know, unsubstantiated claims notwithstanding, it takes a long time to give yourself hypothermia, even in a 34 degree ice bath. So what do I mean by a long time? We're talking an hour, an hour and a half. And the world record, I think, is almost two hours. And that's for up to the neck in total ice. Then, even if you do experience hypothermia, as you pointed out, it's not necessarily fatal. I talked to a emergency room doctor, and she said that sometimes she would get cold water drownings. And the rule is nobody is dead until after you have attempted resuscitation because she has brought people with no brain waves and no pulse back to life as long as 24 hours after they drowned because it was a cold water drowning. And that's her emergency room experience. The cold water is very protective of the brain. You'd think that the brain would die without oxygen. And if the heart stops, then the brain dies because it's no longer being circulated with nutrients. But in the cold, it's not the case. It's more like, um, shoot, I'm going to butcher an analogy, uh, but you go into, I want to say more like a coma. And, and, and because I'm not a medical doctor, I probably shouldn't uh, say that. More like a state of suspended animation from which once you restore the blood flow and you restore the temperature, the brain recovers fine. Now, I'm not recommending cold water drowning. I'm not recommending an hour and a half, two minutes is a wonderful achievement. You will activate your brown fat. You will create all of these neurotransmitters. You will restore yourself to metabolic health. And when you get out, you will feel such a sense of accomplishment. You'll have all the energy in the world. Like you can move mountains or something. You will feel like you have cheated death. And that is um, the kind of feeling that I can get used to. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been doing cold plunges for how long now? Oh, that's a good question. Over five years. Over five years. And what yeah. have you personally experienced in the in that time frame? And how have you changed your practice? How have you optimized your practice? What do you recommend for others now? The biggest part of my practice is psychological, not physiological. I'm now at a point where <clears throat> even though I weigh too much and uh, my body composition is too much fat, metabolically, I'm quite healthy. The brain needs a lot of energy. About 30% of our caloric input is used all up here. So thinking, and thinking is my job, thinking requires a lot of energy. If your metabolism isn't right, then your brain isn't right. And it leads to depression and low mood and like unwelcome thoughts metabolically, the best way to take, sorry, the best way to take care of your brain is to take care of your metabolism. And metabolically, I'm in good shape. But I still have my psychological 
the issues. Now, part of that is because I started an ice bath company. Uh, Jason jokes that Morozco Forge is both the cause and the solution to all of his stress. You know, we, <laughs> we grew way faster than we thought we were going to grow. Um, it has come with sort of these near death entrepreneurial experiences that are a constant source of anxiety. So what do I do when I feel anxious or uncertain or traumatized or under, I get straight into my forge and sometimes I will breathe through it and I never shiver. And other times I will bring the shivering on because that trembling is like a reset for the nervous system. It releases a lot of the stress out of the nervous system and it helps me continue throughout my day as if nothing could ever bother me again. This is why I like it with ice in it. It's why I like it at 34 degrees. You can get the metabolic benefits at warmer temperatures, but to get that real psychological stressor to to look down in the water and see the ice and feel the fear of getting in that's what i'm trying to get over and i've discovered if it's not under 39 it's kind of boring for me now so it's like you know 42 degrees and you get in there and you're like okay i'm doing a cold plunge um but when it's 34, I still get that gasp reflex. I still get that, God damn it, you know, that this 15 minutes of anxiety where everything in my body is trying to tell me I'm going to die and I got to get out of there. And then 15 seconds, you mean? 15 right, seconds, I'm right? Sorry, the 15, okay. those, yeah, yeah, those are the worst. <laughs> I say, you know, you, I say the first 15 seconds of the ice bath are the worst, but I'm not sure that's true. The 15 seconds before, are also pretty bad. The anticipatory anxiety, like you're staring down in there and you're like, why am I here? I think I could skip today. You know, that's also pretty bad. And then after I settle in, then it's great. So how do you typically just do twice or two minutes once a day or do you hang out longer now? Three and a half minutes this morning. Um, so I'll do two to four minutes, but sometimes like if I have company and I get talking, well, the next thing you know, I've done five, I've done six minutes, um, or I'll shoot a video. And the worst thing about shooting videos from the ice bath is the retakes. So now <laughs> like, you know, I do notes and I, I hate making mistakes in the ice bath because then I'm like, darn it, I have to start over. And the next thing I've been in there for 20 minutes, but people are only going to see six of it because I've had to do it three, four times. And then yeah. I put it up there. It's very gratifying. People say, oh, it's amazing that you can just talk like nothing's going on while you're up to your neck in ice. Well, that's the beauty of the edit feature. And plus, you've been doing it for five years. I wonder how long it would take me because I, I know I was not talking. I was not talking during my ice bath experience. It would take I you was... a week or two. Okay. A we, week we've or seen two. this happen over and over again. And there's some good studies with rats. You can't dissect people, but you can dissect rats. It takes about a week to build up brown fat. Wow. So you go, it's, it's so fast. I mean, it is amazing. If I were to say, oh yeah, you go to the gym every day for a week and then you'll be in great shape. I, who wouldn't sign up for that? You know, um, it took 10 days of cold exposure to resolve type two diabetes in these middle-aged German men. So this is a study coming mm -hmm. out of Germany and they all have type two diabetes and they're in their fifties. And they said, here's what we're going to do. Cold air. And by cold, just like 60 degrees Fahrenheit, not even just a little chilly, you know? And they said, uh, we're going to bring you all together and you're going to sit down. You only get a t-shirt and shorts. And that's all you're allowed to wear. And you got to hang out in the apartment where we're going to keep it cold for, you know, a couple hours a day. Ten days later, they had experienced an improvement in their insulin sensitivity that was so dramatic, many of them could no longer meet the criteria for as diagnosable with type 2 diabetes. Ten that's, days. That's amazing. Right? And they told these subjects, you are not allowed to exercise because that would just mess up our study of the cold. And by the way, here's all the junk food you want to eat. You know, we, we hear so much about exercise and eat right. And everybody says, yeah, I should really start doing that. But cold makes up for a lot of other mistakes because when you're not getting enough of it and your body is craving it, your body's like, just give me a little, just give me, you know, I'm going to fix a lot of things up here. 10 days reverse type two diabetes. 
it takes about a week, Laurel. Yeah, that's amazing. Do you crave it now? Yeah. Um, yeah. Gosh, especially because it's like 115 degrees, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's the forecast high temperature in Phoenix. So sometimes I will do three a day. Yeah. There are a couple of times when I crave it. Um, something's going on wrong it, in my life. I say wrong. I mean, there's some stressor, there's some interpersonal conflict that I'm not happy about. And um, I'm going to work that out in the cold. And the other times are... I, maybe I'm just getting so much heat exposure from living in Phoenix um, that I, I want to go in there and cool down some more. Yeah. Yeah. So if people can't afford the Rose Co. ice bath, because it is the, I would have said that the Cadillac or the Lamborghini, but my 11 year old informs me that the Bugatti is the, is the fastest, best car. This is like the Bugatti of the ice baths. It is beautiful. I have seen one in person. A friend has one. And I recently got a, a $20,000 small business grant. And I'm trying to decide to take my brain health practice from virtual to um, in real life in a physical space. And I'm trying to decide what I'm going to spend my money on. Yeah. So um, what if someone can't afford your ice bath? What are some other options? In um, the winter in northern climates, uh, draw a bath of cold tap water. Get in. Um, people do cold showers because I guess they're accustomed to showering. But partial and whole body cold water, different things. Um, in the shower, you you can get your back, but you can't get your front. You can get your front, but you can't get your back. You can get your <laughs> lower half, but you can't get your, you know, it's always going to be partial. And the way the circulatory system works, the part that is cold is going to get shut down. That is, um, vasoconstriction will restrict flow to the parts of your body that are cold to help you maintain your body temperature. So in the shower, you're creating vasoconstriction in one place and moving the blood flow to other places of the body. And this is partly why cold showers make me angry. There's nothing that says you can't have a cold bath. Feel like, okay, guys don't do this. You know, guys don't like draw a bath and light some candles and stuff like that. But women do this all the time. I've heard about it. You can draw <laughs> the bathtub full of cold water, pour some ice in there if you want the, uh, you know, if you want to get that water temperature down a little further and you can do it that way. It's very inexpensive. Now, in Phoenix, in Florida, in Texas, in Southern California, that doesn't really work. Um, now you're in the, yeah, go to the Quickie Mart and buy a hundred pounds of bags of ice, which is very inconvenient. So part of what we sell, and I agree, Morosco is not cheap, but it's convenient. If you had to go down to the gas station every time you were gonna take an ice bath, you just wouldn't practice. I get in every morning, I lift the lid and it's ready to go. At my age, the time that I have to invest is way more important than the dollars. But, you know, you have kids, I have kids, they're not at that stage of their life. So uh, it, it makes sense for them to find other ways to work the cold in. Yeah. After I started learning that cold was good for you, um, my 11 year old would, and I shared it with my family. My 11 year old was like, I'm not wearing a coat today, mom. It's, it's good for me. I'm building brown fat. So, you know, we live in Maryland, it gets cold in the winter. So sure. that's, you know, you don't have to freak out if your kid goes out without a coat and a hat. No, it's, your kids know. They, they know when to come in. Like, what did you think was going to happen? You were going <laughs> to like go out in the backyard and they were just going to be frozen solid. And <laughs> They have com they have more common sense than we do in a lot of ways. But I've also noticed that the kids, of course, they want to do what the grownups are doing. So if you're getting into the ice bath, they're going to get curious and they're going to say, Mom, I, I want to try. And this creates a lot of anxiety for a parent. The number one contraindication to ice baths is not wanting to do an ice bath. Like, I don't know how your instructor was doing it. But the way I do it is no coercion, no bullying, no pressure. 
And I know Jocko Wilnick and Joe Rogan uh, don't really operate that way, but you are never going to hear me, you know, with a bullhorn saying breathe or something like that. You got to get in and out of your own volition. And that's how you really build that sense of accomplishment. You made that choice. You overcame, you know, whatever your anxieties were. I don't want to push anybody in. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that ties in so much with the the psychological benefit. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the retreats that I run are are yoga retreats. And we're always talking about listening to your body and following your your intuition. And if somebody else is yelling at you to do it, that to me is a little bit of a red flag. You want to um, go in with your own uh, your own free will and um, kind of coming out the other end is is like I, I did that. It, yep. I can do hard things, you know. Yep. Um, and you can do it again. The phrase you can do it anytime you choose. Yep. Yeah. And can you go over a little bit more? You you've highlighted lots of the the physical benefits. I was going to ask you, you know, what are the specific health benefits, and what are the the brain health benefits? But that you don't really need to separate them because all of the things that are good for your whole body are also good for your brain. You got it. Um, you talked about building up brown fat. Can you talk about why brown fat is better than the white fat? They have two different purposes in the body. White fat is to store energy for, so that you can continue during those times uh, when you're in caloric deficit um, because food is scarce. That's great. Brown fat is to burn energy. Brown fat has nothing to do with what we really think of as fat. Like, um, just storing an energy surplus. Brown fat's principal role is cold thermogenesis. So keep you warm during the cold. But it also has what's called a secretory role. It creates other chemicals, hormones that circulate through your body. There are two of particular note. Brown fat creates thyroid stimulating hormones. More thyroid stimulating hormone is coming out of brown fat once you've got it and you activate it than any other tissue within your body. The thyroid and the brown fat, they work together. And you probably know that the thyroid has a lot to do with regulating your metabolism. But if it doesn't have the brown fat to communicate with it, to secrete that thyroid stimulating hormone, it's no wonder the thyroid gets dysregulated. So Adrian grew up in Florida, then she moves to Phoenix. She was one of these people that hated the cold. She winds up with Hashimoto's thyroiditis because there is no brown fat to modulate her thyroid function. Restoring cold to her practice brings her thyroid back into where it belongs. Not too much, not too little, not hyper, not hypo. Because now it's in constant communication with the brown fat. So one thing that it does is secrete thyroid stimulating hormone. And here's the other one. It's called FGF21, uh, fibroblast growth factor 21. And what the heck is that? It is a neuroprotective hormone. The brown fat, when it's activated, secretes FGF21, which protects the brain from damage. Now, why would that be important? Well, your brown fat only gets activated in the cold. And when the thermal receptors on your skin sense that it's cold, they send a signal through your autonomic nervous system. Brown fat has a lot of nerves in it. And the nervous system says, get going, brown fat. Brown fat starts doing its thing. One of the things that it does is protect the brain. This is a stressful situation. Uh, you know, th this could go a lot of different directions here. Let's get that FGF 21 up there and protect the brain from damage. Now, I don't know for a fact if that is the mechanism by which we're talking about cold water drownings and resuscitation and protecting the brain from the um, damage of hypoxia. It could be that the brown fat plays a critical role in that mechanism. I'm not sure. But there are studies, both in animals and in humans, that knock out, sorry, in the animals, knock out the FGF21, see what's happening with the, bra with the brain in the cold, and it's much more damaging. When they allow the FGF21, the brain is protected from other toxins and the ill effects of the cold. In humans, it's mostly about Alzheimer's and dementia. Alzheimer's is a metabolic disease, and people 
they fail to realize this partly because we are so caught up in this drug paradigm. The, the pharmaceutical companies seem to have us convinced that there should be one drug to treat one condition. And if you have seven different conditions, then of course you need seven drugs, except for all the side effects that those drugs create. And so you need seven more drugs to treat the side effects of the drugs that you are already taking for the seven conditions that you have. It's all ridiculous. If you're doing something that isn't good for your whole body, it's because it's not good. Exercise makes you smarter. Well, how does that work? You know, your brain isn't doing the push-ups, but exercise is good for your body. It improves your metabolism. It increases insulin sensitivity in the brain. And now your brain works better. Sunshine helps everything in the body. And cold exposure is like that. So it is good for your brain in the sense that it is a, has these systemic therapeutic effects. But there are specifically aspects of brown fat that are there to protect your brain during times of stress. Yeah. Yeah, I'm learning so much from you. This is awesome. All right. I'm so glad that, that we're, we're going to be able to have the, the transcripts of this. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I can reference it later. Uh, it's, it's fabulous. So I, I had a cursory understanding of brown fat before, and now I'm, I'm learning more. It's awesome. So you've talked about um, insulin sensitivity multiple times and talked about how cold exposure can help someone with type 2 diabetes and do you know the mechanism about how that works? Yeah. Um, brown fat is great for insulin sensitivity. Uh, when you, and we got some really good data on this. When you get into the cold, you activate the brown fat, it begins clearing glucose from the bloodstream right away. So a type two diabetic who's running high, um, we had one guy who was about 240 when he started his ice bath, brought him right down to 125. Now, some people would say 125 is a little high, but he was thrilled because He's type two diabetic. He's not used to seeing that healthy number. How did that happen? Activate the brown fat, clearing glucose from the bloodstream to fuel cold thermogenesis. But it also stimulates what's called mitobiogenesis. Brown fat is packed with mitochondria, thousands of mitochondria per brown fat cell. And it makes sense because of the micro mitochondria, these little organelles inside each cell, they're responsible for energy conversion. So let's say you eat too many carbs and you've spiked your blood sugar. The insulin now helps transport the glucose from the bloodstream into the body cells. If you need that energy for uh, wound repair, great. If you need it for growth, like in puberty, that's great. If you need it to move, that's great. It can fuel exercise. In the absence of growth, exercise, repair, your body's, or thermogenesis, your body's like, well, I guess we're going to store it for later. It is your mitochondria that are responsible for converting the glucose energy into ATP that fuels everything else in your body, including the production of lipids that will then go into your white uh, fat cells and be stored for later. The problem is when you eat too many carbs, so carbs that aren't going to get used right away, you can flood the mitochondria with glucose and the mitochondria are going to work as hard as they can. They produce what are called reactive oxygen species, just as the like part of their ordinary job of redox reaction modulation produces some of these free radicals. And ordinarily, those free radicals get absorbed by compounds like melatonin mitochondria make their own melatonin and they scavenge that up and it's no big deal. But when they're overwhelmed with carbohydrates, the reactive oxygen species are produced in excess. They can damage the DNA in the mitochondria. And this is something that a lot of people don't understand. There's DNA in your nucleus. You get half your chromosomes from your dad and half your chromosomes from your mom. And we all learned about this in middle school. Mitochondria have their own DNA. They are inherited only from your mother. And they are, outside of mutations and other aberrations, identical to your mother. The DNA in your mitochondria are immortal in the sense they, they get passed down from mother to child and so on. In a way, the mitochondria don't care whether you live or die because your mitochondrial DNA are already in your children. 
they're like, we're doing great. We don't need this specific mm -hmm. organism. When they get overwhelmed with glucose and they produce too many reactive oxygen species, it damages the mitochondrial DNA. So what happens? Mitochondrial function declines. Your body forms resistance to the action of insulin. So it's called insulin resistance. And to date, nobody has really hypothesized the evolutionary biological purpose of insulin resistance except me. And I'm not saying I'm even qualified to make this hypothesis. Like Ben Bickman wrote a great book called Why We Get Sick. And it's all about insulin resistance and its association with chronic illness. And Ben doesn't say, but why should we be insulin resistant? So here's my engineering hypothesis. Insulin resistance is not the problem. It is your body's attempt to find a solution to all those carbs that you're eating. If you eat carbs, it destroys your mitochondria. Mitochondria are the key to living a long, healthy life. And your body is like, wait a second, if we take out the mitochondria, we're all gonna die. We, and it's not the mitochondria, it is the cell wall that becomes insulin resistant. They say, we're gonna keep that blood glucose in the bloodstream. So we're just gonna drip feed it to the mitochondria. We're gonna give them a break so that they don't wind up damaged. So what happens when you get in the cold? You activate the brown fat, you're recruiting new brown fat cells. Brown fat needs lots and lots of mitochondria. So your body's like, hey, we better make more. How do they make more? The first thing that your body knows how to do is identify the damaged mitochondria and say, can this be fixed? And if it can't, kill it. Identify the good mitochondria and say, can this be replicated? And if it can, make more from the good ones. You can upgrade both the quantity and the quality of your mitochondria because your body has these microscopic selection mechanisms for picking which mitochondria to reproduce. If, you have, if you're in bad shape, insulin resistant, type 2 diabetes, mortality goes way up. Using cold exposure, and by the way, intermittent fasting, ketogenic diet, low carb diet, and exercise all have similar effects but none of them will stimulate brown fat like cold exposure will. So cold exposure comes along and it says, we're gonna um, activate this process called mitobiogenesis. And that is the creation of new high quality mitochondria that will restore you to a more youthful state, reduce your expected mortality, lengthen your life, and improve your capacity to convert glucose, to convert energy. When you get in the cold, insulin sensitivity goes way up, which is another way of saying insulin resistance goes way down, which is how those German men and those middle-aged you know, soccer fans that are sitting around in their T-shirts, how they resolve their type 2 diabetes using the cold. So where are uh, we going with this? Mitochondria are the key to age. They're the key to brain function. They're the key to growth. And you can prevent what people call the diseases of aging. You can postpone those diseases. You can manage the risk of them by keeping your mitochondria in good shape because all of those chronic diseases associated with aging are really they're not because you're getting older, they're because your mitochondria are accumulating a series of defects without restoring themselves. It's because your metabolism is on the decline. Right. So the main benefit of cold exposure is increasing the amount of brown fat, and that can happen in as short as 10 days. Uh -huh. And then the multiple benefits of brown fat are what you just described, but creating the brown fat is really cold exposure is the only way to do that, right? Not it is exercise. the best way to do that. There okay. are some foods that will activate brown fat. There are um, some drugs that will mm -hmm. uh, overcome insulin resistance. Viagra is a great one. Uh, you know, the, the magic little pill. Um, we know what it does, but few people understand how it works. Viagra was originally formulated to treat hypertension. Well, what would make people think, you know, Viagra overcomes insulin resistance so that the endothelial cells inside your blood vessel can produce nitric oxide. The nitric oxide causes the smooth muscle tissue around the blood vessels to relax. 
dilates the blood vessels, improves blood flow. So now you can see why Pfizer was like, oh, we should test this for hypertension. If we expand the blood vessels, we will reduce blood pressure. We should test this for angina, which is a chest pain you get when your heart isn't getting enough blood. So they're like, yeah, you know, we're going to fix this metabolic disorder and we're going to see if we can improve circulation. The men in the original Viagra trial, they were there for blood pressure. And when they, you know, went to their checkup appointments, they're like, um, doc, uh, can I tell you something? You know, and <laughs> men don't talk problem. about sexual function, right? <laughs> but this happened enough times where Pfizer's like, wait a second, what's going on? And then somebody said, well, you know, how does the penis work? Well, you have to fill it up with blood. Uh, and we're like, oh, yeah, Viagra overcomes the metabolic obstacle to production of nitric oxide so that we improve blood flow. And they switch. They're like, we're going to get this approved for impotence, which is now called <laughs> right. erectile dysfunction. It's one of the best, biggest sellers ever. Well, you know what else they use Viagra for? Treating hypoxic brain injury in infants. Mm. Be and it's the most, you're like, that makes no sense. You're like, how could like the male penis drug, you know, all, because of the mode of action, up to 60% right. of the energy that an infant uses is in using and growing the brain. When the infant is a baby's first born and its brain, you know, as big as it feels when, you know, it's proceeding down the birth canal, its brain is nowhere near as large as it needs to be. So all of this energy is going into growth and into brain development in particular. When an infant, maybe it was an umbilical cord issue or maybe it was some other issue, experiences hypoxic brain injury, like their brain didn't get enough oxygen, mm -hmm. Viagra improves the blood flow. Viagra improves the mitochondrial function in the endothelial cells. Viagra creates this systemic benefit that helps the baby get the energy they need to fuel brain growth and recover from hypoxic brain injury. Now that is an amazing little detail. So what am I saying? There are other things that will, um, berberine is one, metformin is one that will overcome the action of insulin resistance. Rapamycin is another one. And all of them are drugs you're taking to do what natural cold exposure could stimulate your body to do by itself. So, I mean, I know this guy's my age, I'm 57 now, and they take their prescription meds. I'm not taking any prescription meds. And I don't know if I'm ever going to need them. I hope they're there when I do. But that is the abnormal condition. Or maybe I should restate that. I'm no longer interested in being normal. Like whatever the doctor says is normal for a 57 year old man like me. I don't want that. I want much better than normal. They tell me my testosterone is supposed to decline as I get older. But every time I get tested, I'm up, up like a thousand uh, nanograms per deciliter, which is typical of a 19 year old instead of a 57, because I don't want normal. I want healthy and normal in the United States these days. It's sure not looking healthy. Oh, no. So let, let me just get some clarity um, on, on the brown fat question. So the, the cold exposure is the only thing that, or it's not the only thing that I increases it's brown it's the best fat. thing. There are the other things, uh, okay. foods and drugs that will activate brown fat. And um, some of them will, to some extent, recruit mito mitochondria into white fat cells is called beijing. So you can turn a white fat cell into a brown fat cell by mm -hmm. through this process of mitobiogenesis by adding mitochondria to it. Okay. And that's all very interesting. But in my view, is that those are substitutes for cold exposure. They're, um, they're doing what cold exposure can stimulate your body to do by itself. There are other ways to do it. So not the only way Cold exposure is the best way to yeah. activate and recruit your brown fat. Yes. So I, I will look forward to winter in a different way. And you have so. definitely, definitely inspired me to, to do um, not just wait for the retreat in August to do this cold plunge, but to, you know, clean the bathtub and throw some ice uh, in there and, and yeah. give it a go on my own for 
overall health benefit, for brain benefit, for for my MS. Um, so I'm I'm you're very inspiring in in helping to describe the why behind why this is beneficial. Um, I like to, terrific to to share those details to learn those details. That's really important. Well, if that understanding helps you get in your bathtub, fantastic. <laughs> And keep going. Going to do it. It, keep you going. know, if it's 60 degrees, you're getting a benefit. Remember those German guys in the cold air, 60 degrees. It, yeah. You don't have to, um, you don't have to hurt so much. Um, if you're experiencing the gas reflex, it's cold enough. Uh, if you're in there long enough to feel an impulse to shiver, you've done enough. So the rule of thumb is cold enough to gasp, long enough to shiver. And you can play with those variables however you want. You can go a little colder and you don't need as much duration. You can go a little warmer and you might find that you got to stay in longer before you start to feel that impulse to shiver. What you don't have to do is martyr yourself in the ice bath. Okay. Okay. Now we started off with the, the idea that women and men might handle this differently, but I don't think we went down that road. Can you um, share? I'm glad you mentioned different? that. Yeah. Almost all the research on cold exposure and testosterone is with young athletic men. So these are men that are competing at a very high level. And the reason is, you know, if you're the Italian rugby team, you know, like, how do we recover faster from injury? How do we build more strength? How do we get more out of our weight training? Um, there's one study uh, of women, and it was accidental. They mm -hmm. were doing the cold presser test, and they wanted to understand how women would respond to stress and things like that. They, one of the things that they measured was testosterone. And so these are young women, not menopausal women, but like college age, early 20s. They do the cold presser test. They measure the blood serum levels. I'm sorry, saliva levels of testosterone, and they got a boost. Now, when it came to men, all of these studies of men show that if you do the exercise and then the cold, testosterone goes way down. It suppresses anabolic activity. And so this is why Huberman and me and other people are out there saying, do not use, men, do not use the ice bath to recover from your workout. It feels good, but it will reduce the gains of your workout. Use the ice bath before your workout. Because for men, when they do the cold first and then work out, big testosterone boost, and that means anabolic gains. But it looks like this one study measured a testosterone booth without the exercise. And it wasn't even whole body immersion. It was just cold stimulation. So when you think about the anatomy of women and men, the gonads in both sexes are responsible for producing testosterone. So for men, that means the testes. And for women, that means the ovaries. Well, where are the testes? They're outside the body. I get in the ice bath and the testes are like, whoa, it's cold. But your <laughs> gonads, your ovaries are inside your body. They are well protected from the cold. Why shouldn't we expect that women and men respond to cold stimulation differently? And mm -hmm. they do. So I wish I had more data. So far, I haven't found women who are willing to like get the labs done and write. I found women who are like, no, no, I don't want testosterone. Uh, I'm going to have, what am I going to grow a beard? You know, uh, they're yeah, sort of afraid of testosterone. Yeah. But that's a problem. Um, what they don't realize is the dominant sex hormone in men is testosterone. Everybody knows that. What women don't realize is the dominant sex hormone in women is testosterone. A healthy woman has three times the testosterone as she does estrogen. And when you get your labs, it's not obvious because they're reported in different units. You have to convert the units on the lab to, to realize that there's more testosterone in a healthy female body than there is estrogen testosterone is the lust hormone. And so, especially after menopause, when the ovaries are less active and they sometimes produce less testosterone, some women will seek testosterone replacement therapy. The problem is that there are no FDA approved protocols to guide clinicians through testosterone replacement therapy for menopausal women. And so they have to take protocols for men and adapt them. And that's a pretty crappy way to do it. 
a better way to do it. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if an ice bath practice could modulate a woman's testosterone to maintain it at healthy levels, even after menopause, when her overreaction is reduced? And I just don't have the data to demonstrate whether that works or not. So there are differences between men and women, particularly in the sex hormones, which shouldn't surprise us, and how they respond to cold exposure, because men and women are different. You know, they have different anatomy and they respond to their environment in different ways. Yeah. I hope somebody does that research. Wouldn't that be fun? That, yes. <laughs> yeah. That's important. Yep. I, uh, there's a book somewhere over there on my shelf, The Secret Female Hormone, and it's testosterone. It's about no testosterone. kidding. Yeah. Oh, what a great book. Yeah. yeah. My GYN gave it to me. Like, you need to read up on this. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you've shared so much awesome information. I'm um, glad. Yeah, this is going to be super helpful for our audience. And and like I said, for me to review with the transcripts as well. <laughs> so, Terrific. Yeah. So tell us about um, the Morozco Forge and how, you know, you, you used, the two of you used your engineering minds to make it different than other ice baths. I, the, yeah. the friend who uses it said he loves to have the physical ice around yep. him, that it's like comforting in some way to have I the physical the same ice. Way. And it's yeah. bumping up against your neck and you feel it on your back. And I don't know why, but that's what I got used to. So that's what I want. And sometimes people will call me up and they'll say, well, why do I need ice? And I'll say, you don't. I mean, you can get a lot of metabolic benefits without the ice. And I need the ice. And I invented it. So I had the ice in there for me. And they're like, well, why do you need ice? And I'm like, I don't know. Like it just, it changes the whole experience when, and it's not just for Instagram because it looks good on Instagram, but when you <laughs> stare down into the ice bath, if you don't see ice, like you don't feel that, that tension, that anticipatory anxiety, that lump in your throat that goes, oh, this is going to hurt. And so there's something psychological about the ice, both being in there when I'm surrounded by it and seeing it when I'm about to get in. At the time, there was no such thing as an ice bath. There was a company called Cold Tub and they were coldtub.com and they were selling their cold tub, you know, which is the opposite of a hot tub. They were selling it to sports teams and, you know, they're still out there. I'm pretty sure you can buy one but they don't make ice. They had a fiberglass tub, just like a hot tub would, and they had a chiller unit built in there. And we said, we didn't wanna buy a cold tub. We wanted an ice bath. And so we, it is so much cheaper, Laurel, to like call up China and say, I want a chiller. And then to drill some holes into a bathtub and circulate the water through the Chinese chiller. And you only get down to like 40 degrees Fahrenheit, but it is so much cheaper. That's just not what we wanted. So we got, you know, refrigeration equipment and copper coils, and we did all the wiring ourselves and we did the thermodynamics ourselves and we built an ice bath that makes ice and it is still the only ice bath, true ice bath in the United States. There's a, actually in North America, there's another company called Brass Monkey, which is very clever. They're in the United Kingdom and they also make ice. Uh, they called us up and they said, you know, we're looking at this and uh, would you help us out? Which is a weird thing to do. Um, but we thought it would be a lot better to cooperate with other people trying to figure out the same thing and share as much knowledge. We haven't sold a single Morosco into the United Kingdom since they went into business, but it's okay. <laughs> We're selling plenty of Moroscos and they helped us figure out how to improve our design by all the things that they were screwing up. So we consider them friends, but here's the big decision that we made. We sh probably should have called the company best ice bath for you .com, you know, or something like really <laughs> literal so that when somebody goes to Google and they type, you know, best ice or whatever, we come up and we're number one. And then, you know, we were stupid enough to name it for a metaphor instead of for something, you know, that would show up in a search engine. And it took forever for people to recognize like what Morosco is. We are now the number one Google search result for four different misspellings of Morosco. And that means that we've created, you know, a unique brand. And I love that too. 
there are two things in particular that are unique about Morosco. And the first one is the obvious, there's ice. The second one is because we use a metal tub, the water is grounded. You are electrically connected to the ground. And it's important because when you got in the Potomac River, that water is grounded. Every natural body of water is grounded and grounding has enormous benefits. You discharge the static electric charge from your body and it changes what's called the zeta potential of your red blood cells. The zeta potential is a measure of their surface electric charge and that relates to how readily they will coagulate. When you're grounded, your risk of blood clot goes way the heck down and your circulation improves. So it's not just metabolic benefits. It's not just vasodilation and those circulatory benefits. It's also the grounding action that you get from cold water, outdoor swimming, and from the forge that improves your circulation. And when you're up to your neck, it's instant. It's not like a grounding pad or walking around barefoot in the grass or sleeping on my grounding sheets, which I enjoy. It's you're so electrically connected that you don't have to be in there for more than two minutes to rebalance yourself electrically. The fiberglass tubs won't do that because they don't conduct electricity An acrylic tub won't do that because they don't conduct electricity. And even a metal tub that uses one of these chillers that is not specifically attached to electrical ground won't do that. But we do that because we put the copper coils in direct contact with the tub and the coils in contact with the compressor and the compressor goes straight into the grounding wire in your house, which goes straight into the ground. We've had it measured by Brian Hoyer. Uh, he does shielded healing is his company's name. And he's measured a couple of different models and it's magnificent. We're very proud to have that kind of third party validation of what we were going for. Yeah, that's cool. I live in a very old house that doesn't, it's not grounded. So I, I have to like run a wire outside to the dirt and stick it in. Yep. But, yep. but for most people who are in a house that's grounded, then it. That is a good point. I would not want you to buy a forge and then put one of those three to two prong adapters on there right. and, um, and not be in contact with the grounded. ground. Yeah. Yes. And another tub that I've seen, um, they had to use like chemicals like you would put in a hot tub. And I know you have a different method of cleaning. Yeah, um, we don't want chlorine anywhere near our bodies yeah. or our customers' bodies. It's, yeah. it's not good for you. And in right. particular, um, the chlorine can produce what are called trihalomethanes. So this comes from my environmental engineering graduate school background. When you use chlorine in the pool and there's organic material in the pool, you sometimes attach a chlorine atom. It's a very aggressive chemical. Attach it to what would otherwise be a methane. So it's CH3Cl. That's a trihal. You can add more chlorines onto it as well. When you get to trihalomethane, now three Cl's and one H left, well, that's a potent carcinogen. And the only way that you I shouldn't say the only way it does exist in nature, but the way we create it is in our swimming pools and in our hot tubs by adding so much chlorine. I don't want chlorine anywhere near there. Mm -hmm. Well, there are ozonators that you can buy for your hot tub and they're supposed to reduce your chlorine demand. I tested like six different ozonators in my kitchen with an oxygenation reduction potential meter, which is the same thing I learned to use, you know, in grad school. And turns out most of them are bogus. They don't work. And nobody really knows because ozone is no good for hot tubs anyway. Ozone has a very short half-life and at high temperatures, you can produce the ozone, but it decays right away because the temperature is so high that the ozone barely has time to act. However, at cold temperatures, the ozone sticks around longer before just splitting up into hydrogen peroxide and oxygen the ozone has time to act on bacteria, on organic matter, on viruses. So we use the best ozone generator I could find after testing all of these, and I was really happy with it. It's made by Dell Ozone. It is an arc discharge generator. So there's a spark that goes between two electrodes. You pass air through it, and that spark converts oxygen in the atmosphere into O3, ozone. 
Then we put the ozone in contact with the water and it's strong enough to deactivate viruses, to kill bacteria and to oxidize the organic matter. And of course, it does not produce chlorine and it sticks around long enough to protect the water. Even though ozone has a short half-life, it is perfect for using in cold tubs. So most of our competitors have some sort of um, ozone system as well. It could be a UV producer, or it could be a different way of producing ozone. What they don't have is the PhD level knowledge of water chemistry and the testing equipment to validate it. They've written a number of articles claiming ozone superiority, and that's fine. I stand behind my own data and my own measurements and the cleanliness of our forge because you are never going to see us instruct you to add bleach every weekend. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So how often do you have to change the water? Never. It's like a pool. Um, you don't change it. You just top it off. I mean, that's what the filtration in the ozone is there for. Now, of course, when you come out, you're dripping wet and you, you know, you bring water out with you. And so, uh, I don't know, every couple, three weeks, I take a five gallon, um, you know, I've got a water cooler. And so the, the water cooler buckets, whatever they're called, it's a carafe of water. Right. I don't use tap water. I don't want the fluoride in the forge. So I'll top it off with five gallons of my water cooler water. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you use filtered, filtered water to put in there. Mm -hmm. And then my friend likes to also add salt. What kind because... of salt is, is Sean adding? <laughs> I think he went to the Dead Sea and collected some. I the... wish he would go to moroscoforge.com and read my articles on salt. Um, and it's because I don't want chloride salt in the forge. Um, sulfate salt, Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate. And, you know, brown fat are packed with all these mitochondria. Guess what mitochondria need? A lot of magnesium. So when you're doing a lot of cold exposure, your magnesium needs go way up. You know, cold exposure is nutritionally demanding. So what do I do? I put eight pounds of Epsom salt, magnesium sulfate, in my forge so that I can get some transdermal magnesium absorption benefit while I'm doing my cold exposure. I also take a magnesium... I can't even pronounce it, but magnesium theo, theorate. Oh, I don't know. Uh, L-theanate. Magnesium L-theanate. Right. Take yep. that for my brain. Yeah, yes. Exactly right. Because yes. some studies have shown reversal of early cognitive decline mm -hmm. but with these metabolic interventions. Magnesium L, would you say it again? Theonate? L-threonate. Threonate. Mm-hmm. It, it crosses the blood brain barrier. It delivers magnesium to the mitochondria in your brain. So I'm like, great, I'll take that one too. Cool. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Oh, I'm so excited. I've learned so much from you. Um, Good. I hope your listeners learn too. I know. And I would encourage you to go to our website. You click on the um, tab that says journal, and you are going to see like a myriad of articles that I've written. They get better over, like I've, I've, I've practiced the new ones are the best ones. But if you scroll down, you're going to see two articles on multiple sclerosis and mm -hmm. cold exposure that are based upon our two customers as case studies and some of the science behind it. Maybe I'll be your next case study. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get your testosterone measured too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Before and after. Yeah. We can, we can do a case study first and then we'll yep. recruit more to yep. the to the study. That would be magnificent. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for your time Thank and you. your yeah. amazing expertise and your passion. I'm so glad that you, you know, found this passion. Are you still a teaching? Are you still a professor? Yep. So I'm going to go teach engineering business practices to the undergraduates. Um, and another class called quantitative approaches to sustainability. I'll have two courses in the fall. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know. You can go check my teaching evaluations. I'm not very popular in that <laughs> regard, but I uh, love it. <laughs> it's a cool topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't have an engineering mind, but I'm very fascinated by your, you know, sustainability practices. I'm glad. That's, that's a passion yeah. area. Yeah. Thank you so much again. It's been a pleasure, Laurel. I hope to hear from you soon. Um, send me a link to where I can get the recording. Would that be all right? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Terrific. Hang on. Um, 
let's 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 share again real quick how people get in touch with you. Did we share that yet? Let's share that. I don't know if we have. Um, you can uh, find more of my writing at Seager TP, S E A G E R T P dot substack dot com. I'm putting up chapters of my book. I'm in the middle of this. Gosh, chapter four is kicking my butt. But uh, in the middle of this book called Uncommon Cold, about the science and experience of deliberate cold exposure. And so I put these chapters up as I draft them to try and get feedback. You know, what's fuzzy? What's not clear? What needs more explanation? Um, so you can find those chapters on my Substack. You can find a lot of other stuff, things about entrepreneurship, uh, things about relationships and psychology, seegertp.substack.com. If all you really want is the cold exposure, then you can go to moroscoforge.com, click on the journal tab, and you're going to see a ton of articles, including one about contraindications to cold exposure. As much as I want to sell you an ice bath, you should know <laughs> these four different reasons, you know, these why you don't want to do an ice bath, and that's in our article. Yeah. So how do you spell Morosco Forge, even though you're in, people will still get the Google hit if they spell it wrong, but how do you spell it? M-O-R-O-Z-K-O. -O that's Morozko. And then F-O-R-G-E, Forge. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'll have to read the journal article that says why you named it that. You you alluded to a... Yeah, a we did a whole video. Um, Morozko is a Russian fairy tale character. You probably remember the Burgermeister Meisterburger. Like, the, you know those claymation Christmas specials? There's Rudolph. But then there were some other ones, too. And one of them... Uh, you know, it was Chris Kringle and it had the Burgermeister Meisterburger character in it. And Chris Kringle has to go through the forest to deliver the toys. Do you remember this one? I don't remember the Burgermeister. I remember the clay animation with Rudolph. Well, I think going. that when I was a child, the Burgermeister Meisterburger must have scared the crap out of me or traumatized <laughs> me or something like this because I remember him the best. Um, there is a character in that claymation Christmas special called the Winter Warlock. And he's very scary. He lives in the woods and Kris Kringle has to navigate through the woods to reach the, the little town and deliver the toys. And the Winter Warlock is gonna freeze him to death, you know? That is Morosko. Morosko is the warlock of the Russian forest who, I don't know, he got, uh, you know, on the wrong side of bed or something, and he's mean, and he's cold. And there's this Cinderella fairy tale in which there's always an evil stepmom in these things, right? So the evil stepmom somehow convinces her husband to take her stepdaughter and abandon her in the woods. Like, I don't know how this happened. I don't know what he's thinking, but this is the way the story starts off. So she's out there in the woods, freezing to death, She's supposed to gather firewood or something, and Morosco finds her. And Morosco's like, uh -huh, I'm going to freeze this one. But she looks so innocent and she's so brave that right before he freezes her to death, he says, Aren't you scared? And she says, You know, I'm, I'm okay. Aren't you cold? Well, no, I'm warm enough. And he goes, You know, a child who's so stoic and graceful and brave, come with me. He makes her a princess, uses all of his magical powers, you know, to elevate her status. Evil stepmom finds out about this. So what does evil stepmom want for her own daughters? So she's like, you get out there in the woods and you go meet Morosco and, you know, you get all the riches and you become a princess. So, of course, the daughter goes out there, standing in the woods. Morosco comes along and says, oh, look, here's another one. Like, who And he goes aren't you scared? I'm not scared. He goes, oh, this is great. Aren't you cold? And she says, damn right, I'm cold. It's freezing out here. Where are my riches? Where is my palace? Boom, frozen to death. So the moral of the story is that the cold has magical powers, but only if you're brave, only if you meet it with grace and humility, and then it will bestow upon you, right? This status and this health and these riches. You go into the forge like a queen. You come out of the forge like a queen. Keep that image in your mind the whole time, and now you will know how to plunge. You don't have to watch somebody's cold shower video or you know listen to Wim Hof if you have the right image of yourself that goes with the fairy tale. 
So we said, we're going to call the whole company, you know, Morozco. We're going to name the whole thing after this fairy tale. And you know what happened is Google was like, who are you? Our customers would come to us and they'd say, I've been searching for an ice bath company for three months. Why don't you guys like make it a little easier to find you on Google? And the answer at the time was, oh, uh, we didn't really know how Google works. Like, I'm a professor, <laughs> right. you know, we're engineers. We, we forgot to hire a digital marketing firm to we were so worried about thermodynamics that we forgot to buy ads and stuff. Uh, but it turned out for the better. Because now yeah. it feels like we stand for something, which we do. Yeah. Um, we stand for this whole method. Nobody gets to yell at the queen. Nobody gets to say, get in there, you coward. You know, nobody gets to talk to the queen that way. The queen gets in on her own time, of her own volition. And you may admire her while she does it or not, but she works at her own pace. And that's why it's called Moraz Forge instead of, you know, best ice bath number one company or something like that. Love mm -hmm. it. That's given me a whole new level of how we're going to approach the ice bath at the retreat. I mean, yeah. we're going to get a crown and everything. Darn and... right. Yeah, yep. I love that. Yep. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad we took the time to hear your story. <laughs> Perfect. Me too. And now we better go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laurel. It's been a pleasure.